Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it would be really cool to be in New York in person, but this is still nice. So uh, as you can see in my title, I, I will be speaking about, well, trying to relate to topics which are not usually related, which is uh, computability theory or, or actually the theory of Turing machines and, and the Euler equations in a large sense. And these works are, are based on, on joint works with Eva Miranda, my former advisor, Daniel Peralta Salas, and Francisco Bresas. So let me recall that the Euler equations, the uh, model the dynamics of an implicit and incompressible fluid. And we will not be fixing the metric in this talk. So we will just uh, study the equations on a Riemannian manifold, which is arbitrary and actually of arbitrary dimension too although I will focus on a construction in dimension three. And in this case, well, all these operators are taken with respect to the Riemannian metric. Uh, this term U is just the velocity field of the fluid. And, and this term here, P, is a scalar function, which is called the pressure, pressure function. So the main questions that we will be dealing with uh, are motivated by works of Moore in, in the 90s who asked whether hydrodynamics is capable of universal computation. And, and I, we will uh, try to explain what, what universal computation in this, in this hydrodynamical context means. And another motivation comes from a, a recent program by Terence Tao that we call here universality program, where he, he basically tries to uh, establish what we call universality properties, although known set, known, not necessarily uh, from a uh, computational point of view, but rather trying to realize uh, arbitrary dynamics in, in the Euler equations by taking, let's say, high dimensional manifolds and, and arbitrary metrics. So that will be the flexibility that he is trying to use. So the concrete question that he asked is whether the Euler equations are Turing complete, which is this uh, universal computation thing, uh, in some Riemannian manifold of any dimension or any metric. Uh, his question was rather focusing on time-dependent solutions, although in this talk we will focus on a construction of a steady solution, which is Turing complete, in a, which is a definition that we will introduce after this slide. So a side question, which is the one he was dealing with in his papers, was uh, can we embed any given flow into a solution of the Euler equations. I will come back to this question. And again, he's essentially, uh, he cares about the time dependent case. So let me now first introduce uh, what Turing machines are, so to explain what it means to be Turing complete for a dynamical system. So let me recall that a, a Turing machine is given by a five tuple and where Q, this big capital Q is just a finite set of states. And there are two of them that we are gonna put it a name, which is Q naught. This is usually called the initial state. And there is Q halt, which means that uh, well, this is the halting state, which is the state that the machine uh, reaches when it finishes computing. Then you have some alphabet, this is sigma. Uh, that we call uh, the alphabet of symbols. And we usually assume that it's 0, 0,1, and actually you can assume it, that it can be any finite set at the end. And then we have the what's called the transition function. So here I'm already assuming that the symbols are 0, 0,1, but here you would have sigma otherwise. And this will provide the algorithm, this, a step of the algorithm. So what this transition function takes is a pair Q, a state, and some symbol 0, 0,1, and it gives another state, another symbol, and some shift. This is the third term, which is minus 1, 0, or plus 1. So a configuration of the machine is given by a pair, Q, T, where Q is a state, so uh, it's in the space of, of states, and then T is the tape, which is basically a, a sequence of zeros and ones, or a sequence of symbols if the, if the space of symbols is not zero one. And uh, we are not saying it, but usually you can assume, so in general, you can assume that 
a configuration of the machine is compactly supported. And, and by this, I mean that the amount of symbols, which are not zero in the tape, is, is finite. So in particular, the space of configurations is countable. So this is just to introduce some notation. When, when I'm looking at a tape of the machine, uh, I write it like this, t minus one, t zero, t one, and the, the dot is just to, to show that the zero position is after the dot. Then the inputs of the machine are just those configurations for which the, the state is the initial state, so Q naught. This is just like what you give to the Turing machine so that, she, that it starts computing. So the algorithm will do something like this. So you have some, some tape, some, some state, and then the machine reads this symbol, change it, changes it, maybe for a one, and then shifts the tape. So this is the precise, let's say, precise description of the algorithm. So you start by setting the configuration to be the initial one. This is the input of the algorithm, which is Q0 and let's say T input. You compute the transition function. So you get a new state, some symbol, uh, tilde T, and some shift epsilon. Now you replace the symbol, which was in the zero position of your tape by the new symbol that you computed and shift by epsilon. So you obtain, a, you obtain a new tape, T prime. So this is the resulting configuration, Q prime comma T prime. So if, if it happens that this new state is the halting state, then you stop. And, your, and the tape that you have is the output. That's the, what you get after finishing the computations. Otherwise, you go back to step two and you compute a, another transition. So in, as I was saying in our previous example, uh, the transition function will, will tell me delta of Q0 is Q prime one plus one. So I change the, the symbol that I have in position zero by a one and then I shift to the left. So now I can introduce uh, what it means for a dynamical system to, to be Turing complete or, or to be cap capable of universal computation, which is what, what Moore was talking about and also uh, tau. So let's say that X is some, some dynamical system in a manifold. You, you can think of a map, a diffeomorphism, a flow, time independent or time dependent. And I will say that it's Turing complete if uh, for any given Turing machine, and, and this is important because it's any Turing machine, not, not a fixed one. And for any input of that Turing machine, you can find a pair P, U, where P is a point and U is some open set, which are explicit. And, and I will come back to this because this is very important. They are explicit in the sense that you can compute them in, in a finite number of steps or, or, or something like this. Such that the trajectory of my dynamical system through the point P intersects the open set U if and only if the machine halts. So it's really like the, the dynamical system is equivalent in computational power to to the Turing machine. So the way to construct this, this Turing complete systems usually is to use a, a very nice fact about Turing machines, which is that there is universal Turing machines. So you, you can think that it is enough to simulate one very specific Turing machine, which is powerful enough to simulate any other. And this is because uh, the, the universal Turing machine takes as input the description of some Turing machine that it will simulate and the input of that Turing machine. So it's enough to simulate universal, a universal Turing machine. So, well, from a few comments of the definition, of course, the, this point P and, and open set U in general will depend of the machine T uh, and the input that you're simulating, of course. And by explicit, and now I will say something more about it, uh, what we mean usually is that we have assigned some, some points of my phase space of my manifold M uh, to each configuration of the universal machine in an explicitly constructible way. And why, why am I insisting in this uh, explicit constructability of my points and, and open set? Well, because if you forget to ask for a, this explicit description, you, you can get some misleading intuitions that, for example, the some really easy maps like the shift map or Turing complete. And this is because 
you can hide the computations in your initial point. So for example, uh, if you have some input, then you can you could compute in principle Q sub P, which is the state of the machine at the step number E of my algorithm. And then I just uh, write a sequence of zeros and ones, which is uh, z uh, zero if the state is not the halting state at the step I, or one if, uh, the, if we reach the halting state. So now I take this sequence and I apply the shift map. Of course, if I find a one in my position, or in my position zero after some, some number of steps, this means that the machine halts. So this is an even only if. The machine halts even only if there is a one in my sequence. But of course, the problem is that the initial point, which will be this sequence of, of, of zeros and ones, is not constructible because, uh, and I, I will say this also in the next slide, the halting problem is, is, is uh, undecidable. So in particular, it's not possible to compute a sequence, this sequence in a finite number of steps. So it might happen that, that you need an infinite amount of time to, to see if, if there's a halting. Again, using these misleading intuitions, you can uh, find some wrong conclusions, which are even worse, because uh, you could essentially map each input to zero if the machine halts with that input, or to one, uh, sorry, the other way. I could map my input to zero if, if the machine never halts with that input, and to one if it does. So in that case, even the identity, the identity map will be too incomplete because you, you take your input, you assign the point zero or one, you apply the identity and check if you're in a neighborhood of one. And this is equivalent to halting. So it's really important for this kind of uh, Turing completeness that, that the points that you have assigned to each configuration are constructible in a, in a reasonable sense. So now, now let's look at a, an explicit example of, of let's say what would be a, a Turing complete uh, dynamical system. So let's say that you have fixed some universal, universal Turing machine, as I was telling you, one which can simulate any other. And let us assume uh, that the space of state is 0, comma, up to 9 and sigma is 0, comma, 1. I mean, in general, you can always assume that the space of symbols is 0, comma, 1 and the amount of states is going to be probably higher than 9 for a universal Turing machine, but it's just to give you a, an intuition of, of how, how to do this. So the way in which, so what we're going to construct is a, a well. We're going to try to explain is what would be a map of the plane that is Turing complete. So the first thing that we do is to assign to each configuration, that is pairs Q comma T, where T is a sequence of zeros and ones, um, a point in the plane. Concretely, a, a, a point which is uh, an integer. And, and this is how the formula that I'm applying. No, I'm just doing an expansion in base 10. Uh, and this gives me a one-to-one -one correspondence. And recall that I told you that the, for any configuration, you can assume that the tape is compactly supported. So this, this really converges always. Then uh, any step of the algorithm is, is going to induce a map between points between these integer points in my plane. So if, if we are to construct a map F such that when you pick a point assigned to a configuration, the map sends it to the next configuration of the machine, then this map is going to be a Turing complete map. And this is clear because if you think of this, so this is what we will have. We'll have like a, a bunch of integer points in, my pl in the plane. Each of the points has an assigned configuration of the machine in a really constructible way. And then, well, let's say this is my input. So this is my point P. And let's say this is the next configuration. So my map is going to send P to this point, etc. cetera. No? And then F squared of P is going to be the second step of the algorithm, which will be here, for example. What happens is that uh, there will be a bunch of configurations, countably many, which are going to be halting configurations. So if I take a neighborhood of those points, which, does, which doesn't contain any other point, then essentially the orbit of my map through this point is going to intersect this open set, even only if the machine halts. Because the, the only way in which this orbit can intersect is that uh, my map sends 
uh, intersects, well, goes, reaches one of these points, which is an outing configuration. Okay. So as I was saying, one of the main uh, interesting things about Turing machines is that in general, it is an undecidable problem to determine whether a Turing machine will, will halt with an input. So what this means is that uh, there is no algorithm which will tell you in finite time if any machine with any input will halt or not. So this was proved by Turing in 1936. So a corollary is that uh, if you construct a Turing complete dynamical system, then uh, the problem of determining whether a trajectory through an explicit point will reach an open set is an undecidable problem. And well, this is a, a kind of dynamical complexity, which is different from the classical chaos, let's say, because here, so in chaos, the problem is that you need, so if you don't know, since you don't know exactly your initial point, the long-term behavior is really uh, different, no? But in this case, even if you know exactly your initial point, the long-term behavior is, is not predictable, essentially. So to put a bit of context to what we did, the first work that we did with Eva Miranda, Daniel Peralta Salas, and Francisco Presas was uh, addressing the second question by Tao, which is, uh, can we embed, let's say, any or arbitrary dynamics into the Euler equations? But we did this for steady solutions, essentially, because we can, in this case, you can use geometric techniques coming from contact geometry that we will be using also for the three-dimensional case. So what we proved is that as long as you, so if you pick a non-vanishing vector field in any compact manifold, which is geodesical, this is a, a geometric condition, then it can be embedded into a steady Euler flow in the sense that you can embed your manifold into a, a big enough sphere so that your vector field extends to an Euler flow, which is a steady Euler flow and the metric depends on all the datum. So it's not a, you cannot fix your metric in the sphere. It's really an arbitrary metric. Let me just mention that as a corollary, we, we could prove that uh, in some sphere of dimension 15, you can find a Turing complete steady Euler flow. But what, I'll be, what I will be focusing on is in, in the next work that we did, which was to try to, to get down to dimension three. So in the first paper, we were just trying to understand the universality properties in the sense of embedding arbitrary dynamics. But now we really would like to, to improve the dimension for the Turing complete thing. So the main theorem is that in S3, you can construct a equipped with some metric, which is not a the canonical one, you can construct a steady Euler flow, which is Turing complete in the sense that I was explaining before. And the key point, let's say the key tool is, is, is given by so-called generalized shift, which was introduced by Moore itself in 1990, uh, which is, uh, as the name suggests, a uh, generalization of the shift map. So let's say that, um, uh, well, a generalized shift is just a map between a space of sequences. So here I'm calling it A to the Z, where A is some alphabet. You can, again, you can think of 0, 0,1. And a generalized shift is given by two pieces of information, which are two maps. One goes from A to the R to Z, and another one goes from A to the D to A to the D. And you need to specify the domain. And the domain means in which part of the sequence you'll be looking at, basically. It's easier to understand with examples. So this is how the generalized shift works. You start with a sequence of, you can al always think of zeros and ones. Then you pick uh, the, let's say the substring of your sequence, which is in the positions of your domain of G and replace it by the image of G. So G takes D symbols and, give you D, and gives you the other symbols. So you replace, the, uh, you replace those symbols in your sequence and then you shift by F. So the, this F is giving you some shift, which is variable. It depends on the symbols that you're giving it as, as input. So you, and, the, and the symbols that it's looking at 
are the ones specified by the domain of F. The resulting sequence is, is, is what you get. Is that, that's the image of your generalized shift. So for example, let's say that my alphabet is uh, 0, 0,1 and the domain is just looking at the position zero. Then I take G to be the identity and F to be one. Then this is exactly the left shift map because what, what this map does is it takes the sequence, it looks at the symbol uh, in position zero, G doesn't touch it because it's the identity and F applies a shift to the left. So this is what's going to do. So this, this is one step. Imagine that this is your initial sequence. G applies the identity in position zero, so it doesn't change anything, and F moves one to the left. Let's now look at a, an example, which is not, is there a question? So let's look at another example, which is not so trivial. So imagine that G of zero is one and F equals minus one. So in such case, imagine that your initial sequence is just a bunch of zeros. Since G of zero is one, you change zero by one in position zero. So this is the first step. And then you apply minus one. So you shift to the left. And this is the resulting sequence. So as you, as you can see, this is already more general than a shift because you can essentially change a finite number of, of symbols. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the main interest of these dynamical systems is that essentially any Turing machine can be simulated by a generalized shift. And this, you can already see why, because, because of these transformations, they really look like a Turing machine. So the main idea is that first, so if, if you're give, you give me a Turing machine, with some space of states and some alphabet sigma, the alphabet of your generalized shift is going to be the union, this joint union of these states and symbols. And then what you do is, to any configuration, you assign a sequence of your alphabet of your generalized shift by putting your state just in the middle, in between t minus one and t zero. So this is going to be a sequence in, in A. And then using the transition function, you define the maps G and F. And, and your maps G and F actually are, are going to be simple because they will just depend on, on, let's say, something like this. They will depend on, on these three positions because your transition function only needs to read Q and T0. Then, depending on whether the shift is to the left or to the right, you will replace here some symbols. You will put, for instance, a Q prime here and a T tilde here. And then after a shift, you will reach another configuration of the machine. Uh -huh. I'm really using a hand wavy proof, but this is the idea only. Okay. And the other dilemma that more introduced is that this generalized shift are induced by piecewise linear area preserving maps by blocks of the square counter set. Uh, so how, how does he do this, this idea? So the first idea is uh, exactly as when you think of the horseshoe. No? What you're doing is to assign to a, a, any sequence of zeros and ones some point in, in your square counter set. And a, a classical way to do this is what's written here. So if you, get, you, you have a sequence of zeros and ones, you take some one side of your tape is one of the coordinates, let's say y, and, and the left side uh, of the tape is the coordinate x in, in a base three expansion. And this is a one-to-one -one correspondence again. And the second idea, which is the geometric idea, is that replacing, uh, let's say, some small number, finite number of, 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 point, uh, of um, symbols of your tape, corresponds to a translation in, in the unit square. And F is just going to be a power of your Baker's map or horseshoe. So this is the Baker's map. If you look at the assignment between sequences and points in the counter set that I just told you, this Baker's map is going to induce a, a, a shift, basically, to the left. And the inverse is going to induce you a right shift. So you have left and right shift. 
So in the case of a generalized shift, the map is going to look something like this. In general, the, the image blocks might, might intersect. This depends on whether the generalized shift is bijective or not. So if the generalized shift is bijective, then the image blocks do not intersect. But if it's not bijective, then they might intersect. So and, and here's what, what more or less it's, it's going on. So this block here, well, let's look at this one because it's more interesting. So this block here is represented that by one dot one. So all the points in the counter set which lie in this block are all those sequences which are of this form. So they have a one in the position minus one and a one in a position zero. So this is because here it's the two thirds and here you have two thirds. So in terms of your uh, ternary expansion, this is why, why this is the block, no? So imagine that uh, our generalized shift has these expressions here that I wrote. Now I apply G. What G is telling me is that I need to change 1, 1 by 0, 0. So what this is going to do is to, by a translation, move the points in my block B here. This is going to be, if you want, G of B, more or less. I'm using, I'm abusing notation. But so it's going to come back to here to C. Why? Because the points in C are of the form of the form 3.0.0. And then I apply F. And what F is telling me is that, ah, this is wrong. Sorry, this is minus one. So what F is going to do is to apply a left shift. So I, I pick this block and I apply my Baker's map. So what it does is to contract it and stretch it. So it goes like here. So this is the image of, of my block. I hope this is a bit clear. So this is the intuition why a generalized shift is essentially a, a composition of, well, well, you need to consider a finite number of blocks, but in each block, it's going to be a translation and, and some power of, of, of Baker's map. So let me just show you here. Uh, this this was this is a figure which was computed well and drawn by Renzo Gruera, who is an undergraduate student, and and this is a, a an example of a map, a generalized shift which is simulating a universal Turing machine. So as you can see, the the number of blocks is is much more higher than only four, and it, it in this case uh, the generalized shift is not bijective, so the blocks intersect within within themselves in the image. So the first thing that we proved is that using this construction, you can show that there is a, a compactly supported area preserving map of the disk, which is Turing complete. The first step is to show, and this was already suggested by, by Moore, although you need to check a bit some details, um, so for, if the Turing machine is reversible, which is a, a computational condition, then the generalized shift that simulates it is going to be bijective. So essentially, if you pick a reversible universal Turing machine, as I told you, there's some details, you need some good properties. The generalized shift that simulates it is going to be bijective. So because it is bijective, the map is really going to look like this. With, maybe with more blocks, but it's going to have uh, disjoint image blocks. So because the image blocks are disjoint, you can simply uh, pick some open neighborhoods of these blocks and then construct some, some isotopy, which coincides with the map by blocks in each block. This is not going to be in general area preserving, but using a, a Moser's path method, relative to the blocks, you can make it an area preserving map of the disk. And at the end, you, you just need to check that there's really the Turing complete property is satisfied, but you, you can already see that, that this works. Mm -hmm. Now, our so with this, we prove that there is an area preserving map of the disk, which is Turing complete. And the question is, uh, how can we improve this into a steady Euler flow? And well, the, the, the way to go 
is classical, which is try to, to realize this area preserving map as a first return map in some steady Euler flow. And here is where uh, a theorem by Edner and Greist proved in 2000 uh, is going to help because what they proved is that the class of rep fields, and I'm going to define this, but these are vector fields associated to a geometric structure, which are contact, contact structures. Um, they, these are equivalent to, to some type of steady Euler flows with an adapted metric. So the metric will depend on the contact structure and so on. So the, this is what I call rotational Beltrami type. So this is just one type of, of steady Euler flows. Well, this connection, although it was proved by Nayed Christ, this one was already suggested by Dennis Sullivan in 1994, actually at this very same seminar. So let me recall that. Uh, so if you're in an odd dimensional manifold, a uh, contact structure is just an hyperplane field, well, a plane field in, in three dimensions that satisfies, satisfies this non-integrability condition. And of course, the defining one form, which I denoted by alpha, is not unique. So if you pick any uh, positive multiple of your defining one form, you get another, another one form whose kernel is the same uh, plane field. So this is what's called a contact form. And for each contact form, you have a, a single uh, line field defined by this pair of equations, which is uh, telling you that this line field lies in, lies in the kernel of the differential of your one form, and it is normalized by the one form. And of course, for every contact form that you pick, the dynamics of the red field can, can be very different. So you have a, indeed infinitely many dynamics, but for a fixed contact form, there's only one. The motivation to study these contact structures is that uh, red fields correspond to a Hamiltonian vector field restricted to what's called a contact type regular energy level. And well, that there's a whole theory of studying the dynamics of these rep fields. For instance, uh, a classical conjecture is Weinstein's conjecture, which tells you that on compact manifolds, any rep field should admit a closed orbit. And, and this is proved in several cases, and there's a lot of people working on this. So in particular, in dimension three, this, this is proved by Tau. Another property of, of contact structures is that, uh, as it happens with symplectic geometry, there is a, a canonical normal form. So, so near a point, every contact structure looks the same, which is this alpha standard that I'm, and here I'm drawing just the plane fields. So our second part of the work, what we prove is that essentially, uh, given any compactly supported area preserving map uh, and some given contact manifold, you can fix it. Uh, you can find some contact form for which the rep field admits uh, a cross section where the first return map is conjugated to, to the area preserving map. So as a corollary, you pick your Turing complete area preserving map and you realize it, let's say, as a rep flow in, in the standard sphere so in the three sphere, three sphere equipped with the standard contact for uh, structure. So you can construct a red flow, which is Turing complete in doing this construction. So what, what's gonna happen is that uh, you have some point, and this is going to be the point, initial point that you had for your area preserving map, and which has some associated configuration and, and then the orbit of your flow is just going to cut again your section into some other point. And there will be some open set in your disk that you can thicken using the, the flow of your vector field. So to obtain uh, another open set, which is going to be associated to the halting configurations. So essentially you, you look at your orbit, the orbit of the rep flow, and if it touches this open set, then it means that your machine halted. And this is, this is why you can somehow improve your area preserving map to a, a steady, well, a rep flow, which is Turing complete. Of course, by the, by the correspondence between rep flows and steady Euler flows, you just prove that there is a steady Euler flow in the sphere, which is Turing complete. Mm -hmm. 
But again, the metric is not going to be the standard one. You, you can say something like, so there is some solid torus in which you have this first return map. And what you can say is that outside of this, uh, of this solid torus, the metric can be chosen to be the round one, the standard one. But where the computations are happening, which is in this solid torus, is not going to be the standard one. It's going, it's going to be adapted to the contact form. So you can also prove different things because as I, as I mentioned before, a consequence of having a Turing complete uh, rep flow or steady Euler flow is that uh, the problem of determining whether an orbit will cross this open set is, is undecidable in general. But you can make some, let's say, more kind of sophisticated constructions in which you can make sure that Let's say that the orbit through this point, let's say through this point, so this is associated to the input of the machine. So you can construct by, by choosing well your Turing machine and your generalized shift, um, you can choose it so that if it holds, so if it really cuts this open set after some iterations, then the orbit is going to close after another iteration. So when you do this construction, you're essentially showing that the halting is equivalent to the orbit being closed. So doing this, you, you can prove other, uh, let's say, other problems which are undecidable for, 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 for rep flows or for steady Euler flows. So you can prove, for instance, that there is a rep flow in, in the sphere that uh, contains an explicit set of points, K, which is just the set of points associated to inputs such that determining whether the orbit through one of those points is closed, this is undecidable in general. And using what's called Rice theorem, which is somehow a, a generalization of the fact that the halting problem is undecidable. So Rice theorem is just telling you that essentially any non-trivial statement on the space of, of inputs which halt is, is undecidable. So you can prove something like there is some explicit set K for which determining whether there is K periodic orbit is also undecidable for any K. And you need to construct one rep flow for each of these problems, of course. So it's not a single one which, which satisfies all these properties. And the same with, for instance, determining whether the set of periodic orbits is dense, whether it has some measure mu for, for any mu, uh, and so on. Okay, so let, let me now go back to the, so this is for always steady solutions to your Euler equations. So now let's go back to, to Tao's program, okay? Because this construction tells you that essentially uh, what, what Moore was asking is true, at least in, in some geometry. But what Tao was asking was for time-dependent solutions to the Euler equations. And his motivation was, so he was speculating with the fact that if one had a, a Turing complete time dependent Euler equations, then uh, it could be possible to construct a, a finite time blow up. And so I, I don't know how or why, of course, but the motivation is that he previously showed that there is a finite time blow up for what he calls an average Navier Stokes equations. And the argument that he uses in the average Navier Stokes is somehow computational, like, but in, in terms of dynamics. So this is why essentially he asks for the Turing completeness. But I, I don't think I can tell you more about this program, but I can, I can tell you what we proved. And, and it, we use several results. One of them is, is, was proved by Tao in, in, uh, himself in one of these papers where he was studying uh, how can we, well, which kind of dynamics can be embedded into the Euler equations in a time-dependent case. So what he proved is that um, if you pick some uh, symmetric bilinear map uh, and you consider the, so here I didn't write it, but you consider the ODE whose, whose derivative with respect to T is given by this map. So I, I consider, uh, let me write this. 
So you consider the ODE, which is given by, by this formula. So th this is an ODE. And so what he proved is that any uh, ODE of this type can be embedded in the Euler equations. And, and what this means is that you have some, let's say here, so you have here your R, Rn, whatever. And here you have some flow lines given by, by this ODE. So there's a map, there's some embedding, which is actually linear, into the space of, um, of uh, volume preserving vector fields. Let me denote this like this of some manifold M of, of very high dimension. So here you have your Rn embedded. This is infinite dimensional, but you can embed this finite dimensional manifold so that the flow lines here correspond to uh, solutions of the Euler equations in the time dependent case. So essentially every point of your manifold Rn is assigned to some initial datum, if you want, some, some volume preserving vector field that if you plug, if you plug it as, as initial condition, the Euler equations will move as X, as the image of this X. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so this is what, what he proved in, in this paper in 2017. Ah, well, so I, I have it written here. <laughs> so this is exactly what, what I was telling. There is an injective map which sends your Rn into the space of, of well, vector fields of M, such that if T, Y of T is, is what's solving this ODE, then the image is solving the other equations. And then this, this previous theorem was strengthened by a, a striking theorem by Torres de Lizaur, which was proved also this year in 2021, where he proved two things. The first one is that, well, one is related to the other, but let's say the first thing that he proved is that if you have a polynomial vector field on the sphere of any dimension, and by polynomial, I just mean a polynomial vector field in Rn plus one, which is tangent to the sphere. So if you have a vector field like this, then it can be embedded into, sorry, there's a typo here it can be embedded into one of these uh, quadratic systems that, that Tau was working with. So th these are quadrat quadratic systems which have this property here. This I didn't say, but it's written here. So it's not any symmetric bilinear map, but it has to satisfy this conservation of energy thing. So what, what uh, Francisco Torres de Lizaur proved is that any polynomial polynomial vector field in the sphere can be embedded into in the same in the same meaning of, of embedding of embedding your manifold and then finding uh, some dynamics that extends it so you can find some some bilinear map in rm for a big m which contains a, an invariant sphere in which the vector field is exactly the polynomial vector field that you started with Another, another thing that he proved, and actually he uses the fact that you can map polynomial vector fields, is that uh, now if you start with any compact manifold, not necessarily the sphere, and you start with any vector field, you can perturb it uh, with an arbitrarily small perturbation in any CK norm, and then it will be it, it, it is possibly when well, it, it is possible to embed it into a quadratic system as above. So as a corollary, all, all these uh, systems can be embedded in the Euler equation by, by applying first uh, the second theorem and then applying Tau's theorem. And of course, all these embeddings are constructible. This is necessarily to, to, to preserve Turing completeness. So the, these are really explicit embeddings. And the metric that, that Tau constructs here is also explicit and the manifold also. So what we proved uh, this is well. This is 2021. Also, is that uh, in some sphere, which is actually 
at least of dimension 17, there is a, a Turing complete polynomial vector field. Uh, and the proof relies first in a, in a construction by people in, in, let's say, in computer science, which is Grasa, Buesco, and Campagnolo, where they prove that there are non-autonomous non ODEs in, in our end, sim simulating Turing machines. In a, in a very similar meaning of Turing completeness. So this we proved with Eva Miranda and Daniel Peralta Salas. So as a corollary, we start with this Turing complete polynomial vector field, whose actually whose uh, the, the degree of this polynomial is going to be around 58. And this is because there was a, another, uh, I think it's called, he's called Henry, somebody else in computer science who computed one example of polynomial vector field that it's, well, he computed the degree, let's say, of the polynomial, which, is, which simulates a universal Turing machine using the work of Grasa, Buesco, and Campagnolo. So you can, by applying uh, torres de Lizaur theorem and Tau's theorem, you can find some contact, compact manifold, sorry, M, G, where the Euler equations are Turing complete. Uh, and the argument is, is essentially similar to what I was doing with the suspension. Like you, you embed your manifold. Yeah, sorry, is... Robert, you, you have a question, I think, uh, in I the chat, it. right? I cannot see it. What, what's the question? Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so the question is, is this the smallest dimension for which this is true? At least, yes, so that we know. The thing is that in this dimension, this really big dimension comes from all the embeddings, no? I mean, the, the embedding by, well, and from this 17, of course. But the, the embedding by Torres de Lizaur depends both in this dimension and the degree. And then uh, Tao's theorem also requires another, let's say, big increase in dimension. So uh, let's say if it's possible that you can improve this by taking a look at these constructions, but it's not clear. Like it's going to result in a really big dimension always. And you can also say something about the manifold, as I, as I told you. So the manifold is going to be of the form, something like this, Tn or Tn plus one, I think. So it's always going to be like this. And this is again, because of Tau's theorem. So Tau's theorem is, is a, a, let's say, a really enhanced construction and an explicit construction where he uses this, the symmetry of this group and so on. Okay. Uh, so this, this is really what, what this solves the question that Tau was posing. And, and this second um, corollary that we got is that there is an analytic diffeomorphism in, in a compact manifold that is totally complete. And this, this was conjectured that it's, that, that it's not true. So it was conjectured uh, by Moore also in 1998 that there are no analytic maps which are Turing complete. And this, this corollary uh, follows from considering uh, the delta time map of, of the flow that we constructed here uh, for a delta small enough. Okay, so again, the, well, the, the metric here is explicit, but it's not canonical. It's not the flat metric on the torus times some good metric in, in your orthogonal space or something like this. Okay. Now let me also finish with some recent results with Eva Miranda and Daniel Peralta Salas which are now dealing with the flat metric. So what we did, and this is not yet on the archive, is uh, construct, to construct a Turing complete Beltrami field, so meaning a vector field which is proportional to its curve, in the, three, uh, in the Euclidean three space, but now with the fixed metric. But uh, note that here uh, we, are, we are in R3. I'm not saying the round sphere. So, the proof, uh, as it's written here, it really relies on the non-compactness. So in, in particular, we don't use generalized shift because the, the main tool 
or well, the main asset of this generalized shift is that it's really compact. You know, the computations are, are taking place in a compact space. So this is no longer true in, in our construction, but the benefit is that um, the metric is fixed. And when we try to compactify using a pro well inverse localization methods, is um, that uh, we cannot get, uh, let's say in a flat torus, for example, we cannot get a Turing complete uh, Beltrami field, but we can we can show something else. So in let's say without going into technicalities, what, what we can prove is that the problem of deciding whether the orbit through a point will reach some open set or not, let's say, uh, this is arbitrarily complex from a computational uh, point of view. This is what's written here. So the reachability problem might have arbitrarily high computational complexity. And the complexity actually, we, we get it as a function of the energy of the Beltrami flow. So uh, the more energy you have, the more computational complexity the reachability problem can have. And, and this also is robust. So the, another advantage is that this is robust. This, this complexity is robust to perturbations. Whereas the generalized shift construction is not robust in general. And in fact, it's proven by, again, several people, including Grasa, um, that uh, Turing complete systems are not robust to perturbations in compact spaces. So we, in non-compact spaces, there are constructions, but in compact spaces, uh, when you perturb, you lose the computational power. It's no longer uh, Turing complete. So in this sense, from a, point of, uh, from a point of view of robust, this is optimal. Now we're saying that besides the fact that you cannot obtain a Turing complete Beltrami field, which, which is robust, you can get a little bit less, which is arbitrarily high computational complexity. So this means, in, in other words, that determining whether the orbit through the point will intersect the open set might require as many computations as you like. So essentially, it's not going to be indecidable, but we could, if we would try to compute it, it might take as, as much time as we want. So and as I told you, the, the ideas behind these constructions are, are very different from, from the ones we were using with generalized shift. And that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. Robert, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Thanks to you for um, this. Are there any questions for Robert? There's one in the chat. Uh, will you be coming to the ICM conference at St. Petersburg in summer 2022? No, I won't. I hope, but not. Um, I have a naive question about one of the, the, the theorems about you had various uh, situations which were uh, not computable. Mm. Um, uh, is it correct? You had mentioned that the, those results were true for, for some metric. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, uh, do you have a, a handle on, you know, what, what, what conditions go into those, that, that type of metric? What are the class of metrics for which those results are true? Mm, no, a priori, a priori, you don't have a lot of control. So the only thing that you know, so when, when you have one rep field, there are several metrics for which this rep field is a solution to the steady Euler equation. Essentially, you need to require that the, the contact plane is orthogonal to your rep field uh, in, your, in the adapted metric. But then in the plane field, you have, you have freedom. You can put whatever you want. But this is the only thing you can say in general about the metric because it, it depends essentially on the dynamics. So if, if you, for instance, if 
if you construct different rep fields, one for which the, the problem of closed orbits is uh, undecidable, and then another rep field for which they're mining if there are at least three orbits is undecidable, and so on. For each of them, the metric is different a priori. And not only this, like there are several choices. For instance, when you construct the generalized shift, it depends on which choice of universal Turing machine you pick. That will also uh, change somehow the dynamics and so the metric. I mean, the only thing that you can say is, is what I said, that outside of the tor solid torus is going to be the adapted metric. And actually, the steady flow is going to be the hop flow. So, But of course, uh, the interesting things are happening where the metric has, let's say, you cannot control the behavior of the metric there. Thank you. There is another question in the chat. Mm. Do you see it? Do you want me yes, to? Yes, yes, I can see it. So the question is, does the computational complexity change if you use a, a quantum Turing machine and not a Turing machine? Well, quantum so, machine, not say yeah. quantum Turing, but <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. Well, uh, the thing is, I don't know because I know quantum, these quantum Turing machines have been used in, for example, in the undesirability of this, the, how is it called? Spectral gap in Hamiltonian systems. This is a work by David Perez and, and well, and more people. But the thing is that for dynamical systems, um, I don't know what will be the, I mean, you need to come up with a definition of Turing completeness in the case of quantum Turing machines. So uh, the thing is, I, I, I'm not familiar with the definition of quantum Turing machine, but I think it's, a, so it's something that- But I think they mind. ask quantum machine, not quantum Turing. Well, is that, I think- I well, don't know. Quantum but computing machine is the same, no? As quantum Turing machine, or, or it's not? I don't, I don't know. Yanis, can you clarify? Maybe he doesn't have a microphone. Oh, I see now what, what, no, no, no. Then the answer is no, sorry. So even if you consider quantum computers, so the, the computational power, let's say, well, complexity, I don't know, but the computational power is the same for Turing machines that for what will be something like quantum computers. Mm -hmm. This is what's called the church Turing thesis. So it is, it's not really proved because it's like, something that it's believed that the Turing machines is the model of what can be computed. And it, it doesn't depend on the fact that it's, you're using more powerful quantum machines because quantum machines, what, what would change eventually is the speed, no? the, how fast you can compute, but not the amount of computations that you need to do, for example, nor the fact that it's undecidable, the halting problem, for example. Is the, was this the question? Yeah, it says thank you. It said thank you. So any other questions for Robert? Well, if there are not, uh, thank you everybody again for, for coming. Um, uh, you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, Paco, uh, Paco's work here. He'll actually be giving a talk later this semester. So um, uh, please reach out to me if you want to be on the, the mailing list for the, for the seminar. And uh, sure. I'll be happy yes. to include you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. Thanks again, Robert and everybody. Take care. Have a nice day.